Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I've got my official professorial glasses on this afternoon to answer some of your questions. Thank you for sending so many in. I hope you enjoyed the program. Um, Linda, Linda L. Stinson. Um, I noticed a couple of different geophys instruments. I noticed they've changed over the years and uh, in one case um, you use radar. Uh, John would be uh, the best person to answer some of the technical details, but I can give you a kind of overview. Um, I think it's true that when we began, we were using what we used to call RES and MAG. RES effectively for resistance and MAG for magnetic anomaly. If you imagine having a current in the ground and you try and test what strength that current has when it comes out, if you're shoving it into dry materials, it comes out uh, with some kind of resistance. If it's wetter, it's slightly less resistance. Um, MAG is the effect of objects on the surface and buried, and it's the Earth's magnetism and how much that deviates. Um, and if you're trying to test magnetism coming through a wall, there's gonna be more resistance to that. And so MAG and RES is how we began. What did change, and we were very much uh, involved in this, in the sense that we observed it happening, was that radar, um, ground pen penetrating radar, became more and more useful to us. To begin with, it just produced sheets and sheets of what um, Channel 4 commissioning editors used to call interesting wallpaper. None of us could understand. And we had to say to John, what's there? Gradually, the beauty of the system John and his team developed was that we could see things in two dimensions in a plan and then three dimensions by taking time slices through the radar. And I think radar is the thing that's made the big difference. And towards the end of the series, we were using radar towed on a motorized cart and, and this sort of uh, equipment enabled us to do huge areas at speed. I mean, these carts would be traveling five, 10 miles an hour, shooting up and down, and lo and behold, we would cover 17 acres. But always with geophysics, it's the analysis of those results, the way the software interprets that material. And that is why uh, John is the bright, intelligent chap he is, because looking at that stuff, and, tw and tweaking the results. Sometimes he'd do some scans, then go back, tweak the results, and then do another scan with slightly different settings. And, and it is a science. I think John made it something we could all take an interest in. And it is one of the exciting bits of magic. I've got sites I know. You look at them, it's a plain field. You go over the top of the geophysics, and suddenly you can almost see the past. And, and for me, it was always the great moment of time team. We were a, really a geophysics evaluation show. And, and thanks to John's hard work um, and the magic of geophys, I think it was always a very important part of uh, time team. Uh, Mark, Mark Vernon Freestone. Um, how did the regular archaeologists, Phil, Mick, Krenz and Neil, manage to be so natural when they were surrounded by camera operators and sound people? Uh, the short answer to that, um, uh, Mark, is I think they probably cared more about the archaeology than they did about the telly. Uh, there are people you can watch on television who seem to be desperate to make the camera love them and catchy and looking beautiful and all the rest of it. Really, the Time Team guys didn't care um, much at all about television. What they cared about was the archaeology. And when I began the show and sat down with Mick to begin with and said, look, you get on with the archaeology and I will make sure the camera is there when you don't think about the cameras or anything we'll find you. And I think it probably did have an effect uh, in the way they were. They were naturally like that. They naturally were interested in what was in the ground in front of them and not all those cameras waving around. We did have the advantage of having some great crew, having good cameraman who can be there at the right time, who can be unobtrusive, 
after a bit, we always knew that it would be Nick or Dennis or someone hovering around with the camera. And I think that rather helps too, because they became part of the team, if you like, which made the whole thing easier. Um, Julie, experimental archaeology. It's great, isn't it? Um, I've always wondered, Time Team builds a kiln and tries to use it. Why not send in a camera person to the site so that the kiln has time to dry? We did kind of had a rule with Time Team that anything we did had to be done in three days. That was the, that's what we had to stick to that. And we had some very interesting um, conversations with people who are reconstruction artists. I remember talking to Damien Goodburn, who's the, the, a genius at making log boats and anything in wood. The Seahenge program was on that. And I said, Damien, we're on a Cranog site in a lake. We need a log boat. Uh, and how long would it make you, you know, how long would it take to make? And he said, oh, about three weeks. And I said, well, say we had the site illuminated at night and gave you 10 people to do it. Could you do it in three days? And Damien, God bless him, and his team hacked away at this huge tree trunk and actually produced a log boat in three days. Damien, I have to say, is a fairly fierce controller of his team and nobody relaxed for those three days, but he got it done. And I always remember when we set it off across the lake with Phil paddling and Tony paddling, that the, the boat had a life of its own. It disappeared off in any direction it liked to go. It was an amazing object. So um, experimental archeology span had to be done within three days. Another site I remember, we had a glass kiln um, and we had glass from London sites, that the Roman glass that's often thrown away. And we had samples of this and we had a father and his son and overnight, they sat through the night to get this glass out at the end of the day. And it was always one of the exciting things. We never quite knew if they were going to deliver it or not. And the three days added to what we used to call the jeopardy of the moment. Uh, Connie Merchant, how long did it take Stuart to locate the previous coastline and how did he do so? Um, Stuart has his own techniques and methods which are highly scientific and highly complex but one of the things that's very useful that we do a lot of is we have LIDAR which gets the heights and the levels of the landscape very accurately and what it enables you to do is flood the area by using software which brings water into those high areas so you saw at Borsi I think we had a wonderful island there and, it, and it's the island nature of Borsi that made it so attractive. You get both protection, you get places to fish, you get a source of food, and you're out of that water. And often those island sites, those early sites, are quite important. Uh, Catherine Fields, thank you for your question. Uh, so many trenches, so little time. Sounds like that's the title of Time Team, I think. So many trenches, etc. Who made the decisions about opening and closing a trench? And are the number of trenches dependent on the number of people, volunteers available? Um, the dynamic of the trenches, it was very important that Mick um, had a very clear idea what he wanted to find. And it often meant that it would be Mick talking with John, that initial geophysics followed by how many trenches. And very early on, we'd be saying, if you dig a trench in archaeology, you have to finish it off. You, whatever you find, if there's nothing there, you still have to make a clean job of it. And so we have to be sure that we've got enough people. Now, there is another factor to that, which was probably me, I suppose, which was essentially saying to Mick, look, you know, it would be brilliant, wouldn't it, if we could stick that last trench in, in this case, Carenza's last trench, which turned up, thank goodness, some rather nice things. And I would always try, if I could, to get that final trench out. Having spent 25 years with archaeologists doing that, I can tell you it's not always the easiest job in the world. But Mick was an absolute joy because he often understood that that last little bit of trench that we needed gave the viewers, will they find something in that last trench? And he was kind enough and knew enough about television to more often than not agree that we needed just one more trench. Um, Eve Jones, um, 
Uh, she's enjoyed the tea time sessions. I assume that these churches would have been built at different times, or have there also been sites with several churches in the same period? Typically, of the sites we looked at in time team, you tend to get a progression of Anglo-Saxon churches, often sort of along the ridge of a hill, where you get one followed by another, followed by another, and then the Norman church comes along. And it was quite, quite often we found these sets of uh, churches. It's almost like they build one and the next one they build a bit further along. They don't like to build it on top of it for some reason. And it, and it is quite often the case that a church will have a, a site like this, will have multiple periods of church. When you're thinking about Norman churches, you could see the church at Borsey. That is still standing, bits of it. And the Normans were building with a considerable weight of stone. And, and, and it's, a, uh, it's likely that that kind of structure is going to last for a lot longer. Whereas with the Saxons, they're basically structured in wood, beautiful buildings, but fundamentally organic. And it's slightly easier to think, OK, we will rebuild another church this year. And given that these sites were very often attacked by the Vikings or people from the sea, um, it's more than likely that some of those places were actually burnt down. But you could put up a wooden church in a fairly short space of time with local timber, whereas often the Norman churches were importing timber. There's not huge amounts of stonework in that area. So I think it's likely that, that the churches are phased over time. Um, Susan Ann. Uh, she notes that she rather liked the idea of Phil taking uh, a part, supervised, supervising due to a slip disc. Um, I remember those sequences very well because Phil used to, when you didn't see him on telly, would be lying on a stretcher alongside the trench. It was a very weird sight. And Phil being Phil did not enjoy the experience of observing other people trying to excavate uh, while he supervised. And there was some very humorous discussions, which uh, I wish I still had the film of, but I don't. Um, but it was great uh, to have him there. Uh, as a supervisor, Phil is just brilliant. He doesn't think he is. He doesn't believe in, as he calls it, management. Either you're in a trench digging or you're not. Um, but he did a great job for us on that shoot. And I think that was probably, I'm not sure Phil ever missed a time team shoot. I'll have to check with him on that. He's got a big archive about this, but I will ask him. Um, Frieda Blake Bradley. Um, uh, now, this is another technical one, and I wish I had Paul sat with me, and we may get in touch with him. Paul Blinkhorn speaks to using cooking residue to find dietary clues. How does one differentiate between cooked residue attached to a pot or something that have, might have been in the ground uh, previously? Uh, a natural soil deposit? Uh, it's an interesting technical question. I'm going to do my best. Over the years, we have observed many pieces of pot coming out, and the blackening on the outside is one very useful and obvious clue. When residue is cooked inside a pot, it does almost glue to the interior of the pot. It's not just hanging about, it is almost caked on it. And if you've ever looked at a material that's made of honey, something like mead or other things like that, or even if in your own experience trying to clean the oven out after a particularly nice um, Sunday lunch, it takes some chiseling to get that stuff off, doesn't it? And I, I think basically we're pretty certain that usually that material is up against the pot and is, is sort of stuck to it and therefore not locally derived. But I've got a good archaeological friend of my, mine who's using a chemical detection device, which is, I think it's called an XPDF or some set of letters, I can't remember. And he will go over a site and he will be able to tell you where certain kinds of activities were going on. So it's one of those areas that have moved on a lot. And if we ever did bring a time team back, some of that new technology would involve the detecting of materials in the soil before we've even dug a trench, which is, so it's a very interesting area. Uh, next question is from Michael Luke. Uh, do you feel that in the 22 years, 22 years, blimey Michael, ages, 
since the filming of the episode that the metal detecting field as a whole has improved in regards to documenting fines, understanding how to go about proper local landscape research, um, and why were the metal detectors brought in? Um, over the years, Time Team worked with a number of metal detectorists, and I think, I hope that we really began to establish um, with them a good relationship which showed that a find correctly identified, stratified, and done in association with archaeologists was going to give us so much more information. In a sense, I know it sounds odd to say it, but the results of that information is so much richer than just being able to grab it, take it to your local eBay and flog it for a fiver. If you can find materials in the right context, and the metal detectors we had, particularly on sites that were likely to be rich in finds, did that job of sweeping fields with us. And I know that Helen, who came on board as an Anglo-Saxon expert, was very keen when we gridded an area to have metal detectors walking up and down it. And I think if you're a metal detectorist and you've got a great relationship with a local archaeologist, that relationship can lead to a lifelong fascination with history and archaeology. And I'd like to feel uh, there's been a more sort of positive move in that direction. Uh, Michael Taylor. Um, a large number of churches have settings that seem familiar to the location we saw today. Um, have there been estimates of proportions of church enclosures that are on much older prehistoric sites? Well, Michael, there's a good bit of research for you to do while you're locked in and sat at home. Um, I don't know whether somebody's done a paper on it, but they are relatively common. I can think of numerous sites we did that were early Iron Age enclosures that happened to have some kind of later ecclesiastical settlement plonked on top of them. And I think the early church fathers rather encouraged the, the, the first pilgrims to an area or the first people who brought Christianity to a site to actually place their churches in what they would consider to be a pagan settlement, rather sort of stamping their authority as they would think of it. And I think it's probably quite a lot of them. I know uh, in Wales we did sites where that circular plan enclosure actually had a much earlier origin than the, than the church that, was, that ended up in it. But it would make a very interesting bit of research, and I, I would recommend it uh, if you've got a few hours to spare. Um, Toby, J. France. Um, the makeup of the team evolved over the years, but also the roles within it. This week's episode is older than others. We've rewatched, and it's interesting to see familiar faces in the trenches. What's a nice game for me to play is seeing people in the trenches who, eventually, who were field archaeologists who eventually went on to do all sorts of other things, um, like Mick the Dig, uh, Mick Worthington, who you, we've seen in one or two recently, Barney Sloan, people like that, dear Jenny, uh, I think Alice Roberts even appeared in one program we've watched. And those people, they, they have moved on and, and gone on to all sorts of great, and wonderful things. Um, and I think it's that, it's that continuity that's rather nice. I was very dependent on them telling me what was going on. So even when we were digging with a whole team of people from the local area, which was very important, I loved to be able to take one of my guys aside and say, how do you think it's going really? You know, because they knew what we wanted to happen. So it was like having friends and allies in the trenches. And I always rather appreciated that. Um, Toby France again, Toby J. France. Did the format of the live shows change how you approach the actual archaeological dig itself? Um, and uh, was it just the way it was presented? Lives were a bit of a nightmare in some ways, but the great beauty of them is we get a lot of resources thrown at us, helicopters and all sorts of things. It wasn't the best thing or the best place to think. Uh, it wasn't a good process for thinking about the archaeology because there was so much stuff going on. Um, and I think you can tell from this that we're buzzing around all over the place, and it's fairly remarkable. But I would again go back to the fact that 
people like Phil and Carenza are not going to be particularly moved by having some live director saying, oh God, we've got to come to you now. They will just get on with the archaeology. People like Sandy are filled in that gap and Tony so that they would do the talking to the camera more and it would allow us to get on with the archaeology. At the end of them, we all felt completely exhausted um, and were rather relieved when they finished, but there was a lot of excitement about it. Uh, it was kind of fantastic. And um, I don't think it changed the techniques, but I think it changed the amount of material we were able to tell you about. There was a lot of space taken up with people running from one side to the other and being chased across fields, which people seem to love on live television. Um, so we didn't have quite the time to sit and look at a thing. Um, but I still think they, had, they were nice to do. They were fun to do. Um, Beth Paulson. Um, I think, Beth, you were the person who asked about Helen, which we sort of referred to. How did Helen become involved? Well, you see her here as an Anglo-Saxon expert, and that's how Helen became and, and, and she would br often bring along the finds that were important to a site. And we began chatting with her. And I'm very pleased to say she became a really important part of Time Team. So that was rather nice. We've had a question from Twitter, um, uh, from Julie on Twitter. Uh, can you tell what people were buried in uh, a coffin or what have you? Um, it's a very interesting process that uh, when you're looking at a burial, um, if you have something like a coffin, then you have the coffin nails, unless they've eroded, corroded away completely. Sometimes it's quite difficult, and it's a very delicate process. And the other thing that we occasionally came across were tiny little pins, which were in the cloths that people were surrounded with. Um, so sometimes the coffin nails exist, sometimes they're not. And I think it's quite a difficult area to be certain about. Um, but in general, the nicest in some ways burials we had to deal with were the Roman ones in cut stone, with cut stone sides. There was something I, I felt rather comforting about that sort of stone structure around those early burials. So it's an interesting question, and I think probably it's one um, that would take quite a lot of research, which has probably been done. So hopefully you'll be able to look that up. I hope we've man managed to answer in various ways some of the questions. It's always great to hear them because it, it produces memories for me and thoughts, and it also makes me dig back in my brain and try to remember answers for them, which is a very good exercise for me. So I hope you enjoy the next Time Team Tea Time, which is, of course, going to be an absolute cracker next Sunday at six o'clock. And I hope you enjoy listening to Carenza and Helen talking about this amazing program at Borsi. Uh, I look forward to your questions next week and please stay well. <laughs>